I say good morning really loud? Oh, let me hear that again. All right. Are there any more boys and girls that want to come up this morning for children's church? Anybody? Any visitors? Y'all want to come up? Okay, guys. Now, listen, before we get started, I want y'all to look. Put your hands in your lap, and I want you to just be listening to me every time this morning, okay? Now, I have something right here. It's a surprise. You got to guess what it is. I'm going to give you some hints and see if you can guess what's under here. Don't yell it out, okay, till the very end. I get sold in a box, but I'm not cereal. I come as a pear and see, but I'm not eyeglasses. I can be shined, but I'm not a flashlight. I have a tongue, but I can't speak. Now listen, I'm worn on your feet, but I'm not soft. Who am I? What? Jeez, let's see if that's right. Let's see what I have. Hey guys, what is it? It is, you're right. Just plain, ordinary shoes. We're all wearing shoes today, aren't we? Different kinds of shoes. But did you know that in the time when Jesus lived, not everyone had shoes? Can y'all say that? Not everyone had shoes. The poorest people, huh? Oh, dusty. Okay. <laughs> the poorest people and the slaves often had to go without shoes. Now, that may seem fun for a while to go without shoes, but sooner or later, that would be pretty hard on your feet, wouldn't it? Can y'all say that? Be hard on your feet. Can y'all say that? Okay, now I'm going to tell you a story today that comes from Luke 15. Can you say Luke 15? And they talk about shoes. You mean they talk about shoes in the Bible? Yeah, listen to the story. It's called the parable of the prodigal son. Can you say prodigal son? Prodigal means, listen, prodigal means to spend a lot, spend a lot on things you don't need and being very wasteful with what you have. You will see what I mean in just a minute. Can y'all say prodigal son again? And that means to what? To be wasteful. To be wasteful. Now, there was once a father who had two sons. Say two sons. One day the younger son said to his father, Father, could you give me my inheritance? Do you know what an inheritance is? If an inheritance is money, the father would give their children after he passed away. But one of the sons, listen guys, one of the sons wanted it urgent. Say, wanted it urgent. The father decided to go ahead and give the money to both of his sons. Well, the younger son received his money, and he left home. Say, left home. And he didn't plan on returning. But the son, guess what he done? He lost all his money. He wasted it. He wasted his money. Soon he was all alone, no friends, because all of his money was gone. No friends, no food, nothing. He had nothing. He wasted every bit of his inheritance. So the prodigal son, say the prodigal son, then realized how foolish he was to leave his family, and he decided to come back home. He knew he had given up his right to be a son, so he would ask his father to be a servant. That way, he would at least have something to eat. So if he worked for his father, he would have something to eat, right? So he knew when he went back home that he might not get to be a son, so he would try to be a servant. Well, he started home. He just knew his father would not be happy with him. But as he got closer, you know what he saw? And he stretched his arms out. He saw his father with his arms wide open. And do you know what his father was doing? He was wet. He was welcoming his son back home. Can y'all say that? Welcoming his son back home. Even though the son did wrong, the father still loved him. The father called for things. He called his servant, and he called for some things for his son. But I'm going to talk about just one of those things today. He called for a ring. Can you say a ring? A robe. Some sandals. These are shoes, a cap to eat, and a shell of rice cream. Okay, but we're going to talk about what today? Any other things? The shoes. Good. Now, the father called the servants to bring the shoes and to place his son's 
to faith on his side. Boom. Why shoes? Do you remember what shoes meant? The shoes represented his acceptance. Can you say that? Acceptance as a son. The prodigal son thought when he went back home that the father would think less of him, but did he? Did he? Did he think less of him? No. He received him back into the family as a son, and sons get shoes. Can you say that? And sons get shoes. That story represents, and this is what I want you to listen, that story represents the way God loves you and me. Say this, God loves you and me. He is our Father. Who is our Father? Our Heavenly Father is who? God. And we are His sons and daughters. And when we do things wrong, we can always run back to where we hold those arms open. God is going to have His arms for us. Outstretched, waiting on us. Now again, what did the Father of the Son put on His feet? Good. Why? To let Him know that He welcomed Him back home. He accepted Him. He was still his son. So I want y'all to listen. Look down at your feet. I want you to look at your feet. And every time you look at your feet, I want you to think about the the story of the prodigal son. Look up at me. Can you say prodigal son? Prodigal son. Good. And remember that the father in the story is like God. This is how God would be if we ran away from him and we started doing things we should. We deserve punishment for our sins, but God still lets us be a part of his family. That's called grace. Okay, it's called grace. Say grace. Shoes. Second chance. All right, say it again. Grace. Shoes. Second chance. All right. Now, I'm about to talk to your parents in just a few minutes about giving kids a second chance. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. A few minutes, okay? Y'all were very good today. Now, who was the story about? What was that big name? Well, good morning. Glad to see you today. I want to invite you to stand, and we're going to sing number 84 this morning. 84, just a little talk with Jesus. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven.
Aren't you glad we can have a little talk with him? Amen. How about a hand clap for him this morning? You may be seated. Amen. And how are you this morning, church? Say glad and happy. Amen. Me too. Hallelujah. Uh, got several announcements to make this morning, so we've got a couple of cards, first of all, I want to start off with. Uh, we got a card from the Dunleavy family. Let me just read them to you. Uh, thanks to the Corinth Baptist Church for all your prayers, calls, food, and friendship. I'll always cherish the love you have shown me and my family. Thank you again, Kimberly Duke Dunleavy and her family. And then she sent an additional card here to the ladies of Corinth Baptist Church who furnished uh, a meal for the family after the funeral uh, back in the fellowship hall, expressing appreciation for every person who had a part in making that possible. And I might also add that we have received some memorial gifts in uh, memory of Ron Dunleavy. We, they came in in the mail this past week for our building program. So we're grateful for those who are helping to sponsor our drive for a new sanctuary. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's get to our current kids, first of all. Uh, on the back of your bulletin, you'll find a picture of a young man who's up in the air. He, he's a climber, okay? Paxton Nelson. He'll be five on May the 25th. His favorite colors are blue and orange. His favorite food is mac and cheese. He's my kind of guy. He loves big trucks, tractors, and construction equipment. He loves digging, playing with his Legos, and tagging along with his daddy while he runs the big equipment. And I would have probably typed in something else, and he likes to climb. So we've got it here on the, the, the playground on the ropes, and he's way up in the air. Okay, we got a lot of wonderful kids. I was thinking when we had all these children down here on the front this morning, uh, these kids are growing up being leaders in the church. Isn't that amazing? I mean, they're not going to be bashful. Uh, just a wonderful program that we're working with our children as we are. Uh, let's see what else I got here. I got the third Sunday of this month is Decoration Day. Decoration Day has already begun in our part of the country. And uh, we'll be having dinner on the ground and folks will be bringing flowers and putting them on the graves. And we'll have a special homecoming service uh, here in the sanctuary on that Sunday morning. And we're going to try to feature... Uh, the music ministry of Corey Baptist Church. We'd like to have a musical day on the third Sunday. And I've got a list. Miss faustine has been helping me, and she has got up, brought up these names. I'm going to read them out. These are the song leaders that can be remembered right now. So if anybody here knows of others, or if there are individuals who are watching online, uh, who have a heritage at Corinth Baptist Church, and you can name some other song leaders that have been elected song leaders in Corinth Baptist Church besides the one that we got. We would love for you to mail us their names at 1350 Corinth Road, Darden, Tennessee. All right, Brother Albert Reeves, Luther Renfro, Kenny Reeves, Willie Manus, Ronnie Hendricks, Parker Manus, Obi Renfro, Keith Renfro, Tim Fain, and Brother Scott King. That's the list that we presently have. So if anyone knows of any others that need to be added to that, uh, we'd like to honor them on our homecoming day. Today's going to be a busy day. In fact, this is going to be another busy week at Corinth. This afternoon at 2 p.m., we'll be at Westwood Nursing Facility in Decaturville, Tennessee. Uh, I did not realize until recently that we are reaching all of the uh, patients over at Westwood because they bring us the... Uh, they bring us a telephone, and I get to stand at the front door. The ones that are able to come to the lobby, they come to the lobby, and I wave at them and talk to them through the glass, and then I take the telephone. It's on the PA system, so everybody inside the building, workers included, uh, gets to be a part of our Sunday evening worship experience at Westwood. So pray for us this afternoon. If you want to come, you can come and be with us on the front porch and be our prayer partners, uh, but that will be this afternoon at 2 p.m. at Westwood in Decaturville. 4.30 this afternoon, Deacon's Monthly Prayer Meeting. You've got any uh, prayer requests or any suggestions, share with any member of the Deacon body. We'll be coming together to go before to the throne of grace on your behalf at 4.30 this afternoon. 6 p.m. this evening, our Sunday evening worship service. Let me in 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 encourage you to be here for that, 6 p.m. this evening. Wednesday evening, we've got a WANA Youth and Adult Bible Study. All of that goes on beginning at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evening and on Thursday, this coming Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. We will be at the Parsons Elementary School at 8 a.m., Decaturville Elementary School at 8 a.m. as well. 
and Decatur County Middle School at 9.30 and Riverside High School at 9.30 on Thursday of this week with a National Day of Prayer, and we invite you and encourage you to come and support that ministry in this area. Pastors and churches will be coming together for the National Day of Prayer. There will be a shower this coming Saturday for C.J. Whitfield and uh, Devin Wilson and May 8th at, from 1030 until 1230 at the front of the church, and it tells where they are registered at. So I think those are my announcements. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for the joy that's in our heart because Jesus Christ is our Savior and our Lord. Father, we thank you for those faithful members that are Corinth that are here today and for those who are visiting. We are so thrilled, Lord, for each of each individual that's here. God, I pray that you'll bless every person that's present today. Lord, we just pray that you'll bless this nation of ours in these very difficult times that we're living in. I pray, Father, that you'd lay your hand upon this nation. Protect us, Lord. I pray for those who are serving in the military, those who are in the fire departments and law enforcement, uh, for those who protect our property and our lives. And I pray, Lord, for our wisdom and clarity for those that make decisions uh, that affect the lives of every individual. God, just take us today. We pray if there's anybody here that does not know Jesus as their Savior and their Lord, may this be the day, may this be the time, and may this be the hour when they come to a full understanding of their need of repentance and faith in Jesus, and may they get wonderfully and gloriously saved today. Father, we pray that you'd bless the mission in Belize and Central America and other places around the world. Wherever this message and this worship service goes, we pray that souls will be saved, your people revived, Jesus will be honored in all things. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Talk about the few drivers for a moment. Um, you don't have to look around and say who you might see on here in a minute. But if you have been in the joining hallway, you'll notice that um, you wonder what's going on. Well, our church has been a different project to help raise money um, for a new sanctuary. So our children's department is promoting a food drive, and we're calling this um, "Old Souls to a New Sanctuary." So how can you help raise funds? These are not just shoes for people to put on their feet, but to get them back on their feet, and this is how it works. From now to the end of July, our church is collecting gently worn, torn new shoes, and organi an organization called Sons to Org will basically issue us a check for collected shoes. We collect, we bag them, that's it. They will come and pick them up and issue us a check. All, do all donated shoes will then be a part of a network of small business partners that Sons to Org works with all throughout the world. Places such as Indonesia, Ghana, Haiti, um, Uganda, and then there's, there's a few more that I haven't listed. But these partners, Sons to Org, help people in other countries where economic opportunity and jobs are limited. This organization helps people start up small businesses, similar to our um, flea market is what they have over there, and they set up and they sell different items like shoes. The shoes that are collected here are given to these people to help get them on their feet financially. Once the small business is up and going in the other country, the small business will in turn purchase future shoes from this funds to org. And this is just so that funds to org can just keep doing what they're doing and just keep their lights on and be able to uh, come and pick up the shoes and, and all those things. But most people have more shoes than they need or want. And by donating them to funds to org, we raise money for our building funds and we keep families in developing nations who need economic opportunity. It's a win-win. It's a win-win for everybody. Um, so with all that being said, the goal for the souls to the new sanctuary drive, shoe drive, is 100 bags of 25 pair of gently worn or new shoes. That's a total of 2,500 500 pairs of shoes. And it sounds like a lot, but so far, and we hadn't really even started our shoe drive, but so far we've collected 275. So uh, we are still a little ways off, but we, we can do it. We can do it. What kind of shoes? Boots. Sandals, any color, any size. Um, we got red shoes, we got sparkle shoes. So any kind of shoe is good as long as it's gently worn or new. If our goal is not met, if our goal is met by the end of July, uh, funds to org will issue our church a check for a thousand dollars. And if we if we have more shoes, the more shoes we have, the more money they will um, issue us a check for. So here's a new, here's a challenge that I'd like to invite you to do. Number one, hit up yard sales. I, 
did that yesterday, and if you'll tell the people what you're doing it for, they'll they'll give you a pretty good deal. So go to yard sales, clean your closets out, give your kids a second chance. Ask your family members, friends, co-workers, kids, ask your friends at school. And here's the big challenge for anyone that would like to participate. Like I said, if we collect 100 pair of shoes, that's $1,000 from Funds to Order. The challenge is for individuals or couples, Sunday school classes, families, to match the amount collected up to whatever we collect. So you can match up to 250, 500, 750, or if we get to 1,000, match to 1,000. So um, we already have six individuals and couples that have pledged to donate up to 1,000 if we collect that. So right now, if we have 100 bags, which is 1,000 from funds to or, along with the pledges, we already have $7,000 towards our building fund. So, and we haven't even really started. So, God is good, God is faithful, and he's going to, will bless us if we'll do our part. There's an insert in your bulletin this morning, um, or you can see me if you'd like to make the pledge. Uh, there's a box in the adjoining hallway that you can drop it in. It, it will be confidential. You can drop your pledges in there, or you can see me. But uh, I want you with this. I know the purpose of this shoe drive is for us to raise money for our building fund, which will lead to a new sanctuary one day. But this shoe drive is also a way for souls, S-O-L-E-S, to help souls, S-O-U-L-S. This is a two-in-one project. We help our church financially, and we help other countries financially just by donating a pair of shoes. So I want to show this little video, too, to kind of give you an idea of what funds to or means. say about you? What would mine say about me? It depends on the pair, I guess. You could ask the black shoes, the brown shoes, the old shoes for raking leaves, or the running shoes that make it look like I'm running. According to surveys, the average American owns 15 pairs of shoes. Think of how many stories they could tell. Now, imagine your life without shoes. Right now, there are hundreds of millions of children around the world that do not have a single pair of shoes. You'll find them in places like Africa, Asia, and Haiti. Haiti is a perfect example of how shoes save lives. There are the obvious ways having to do with sanitation. An open cut on a bare foot in filthy water can and usually does mean unimaginable sickness. But shoes mean so much more here. Recently, an eight-year-old girl was given her first pair of standard black shoes. Nothing remarkable about them until you realize that in many developing nations like Haiti, in order for a child to attend school, he or she must have a pair of standard black shoes. It seems so simple, yet there are so many children who don't have that luxury. With the average Haitian making less than $2 a day, people trade for what they need, whether it's crops or livestock or medicine. It's how commerce works in Haiti. And some of the most valuable goods to trade are shoes. There was the story of a woman who traded a pair of Nike running shoes for a goat because she was unable to produce milk for her newborn baby, and the goat's milk meant the difference between life and death. Shoes save lives. New shoes, used shoes, shoes that you don't wear, don't need, and don't want anymore. Imagine giving five of your 15 pairs of shoes. Then multiply that by the number of people in your house, and then get 10 friends to collect the same amount and encourage them to tell their friends. Now imagine if your church, or school, or civic group, or club, or other not-for-profit organization takes up the mantle. Before you know it, you are literally impacting the lives of thousands of the poorest people on earth. Now what if I told you that the folks at Funds to Orgs would pay your organization for each pound of shoes that you collect? You will be providing footwear that is desperately needed throughout the world. And in return, your organization will receive funds to continue your own mission to make the world a better place. We are funds to orgs, and we need your help. We need your shoes.
On holy ground, we are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels. Child and claim it for you. Jesus, now we are standing in His presence. We are standing in His presence. We are standing in His presence. On This morning, so uh, if you would, you stand with me. I'm going to ask Brother Kevin Cox if he'll bless our offering today.
to sing number 265, Shelter from the Storm.
Thank you, Suzanne and congregation and choir. It is good to have the choir back. They're practicing on Sunday evenings at 5 o'clock, so if you'd like to join the choir, there is room in the choir for you. Just be here to practice with them, and they would love to have you. If you've got your Bibles handy, I want you to get them, please, and turn to me in the Old Testament, Minor Prophet, Book of Amos, Little Book of Amos. And we're going to the fourth chapter of the book today, the little book of Amos, chapter 4. And there is a theme in the book of Amos, chapter 4, that really stands out. It comes in the 12th verse of the chapter. Thus, therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to me thy God. So if you want a title for the message today, you can title it, Prepare to Meet God. But well, we're going to read the entire chapter. Let's read the entire chapter of the book of Amos, the little prophet of Amos, because there's so many parallels between what Amos was experiencing and what we're experiencing today, what the nation of Israel was going through and what America is going through today. So let's read it together. It begins in an unusual manner. Amos chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that are in the mountains of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crusheth the needy, which say to their masters, Bring and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, Lo, the days shall come upon you that he will take you away with hooks, and your posterity with fish hooks. And you should go out at the breaches every cow at that which is before her, and ye shall cast them into the into the plat palace, saith the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress, at Gilgal multiply transgressions, and bring your sacrifices every morning, and your tithes after three years. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this lack of a few, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places. Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord and also I've been holding the rain from you when there were yet three months uh, to the harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied, yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blessings and mildew. When your gardens and vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased and the palmer worms devoured them, yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilences after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with a sword and have taken away your horses and I have made the stink of your camps to come up under your nostrils, yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I've overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and you were as a brand, firebrand plucked out of the burning Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. For lo, he that formeth the mountain, and creates the wind, and declareth unto man, what is his thoughts that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth? The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Who is this man, Amos? It may surprise you that he was not an educated, well-trained religious leader of his day. 
He was a God called man. Chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible gives us an introduction to who this Amos the prophet is. The word of the Lord are the words of Amos who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa. He was a herdsman. And if that is not enough, look over, if you will, in the seventh chapter of the book. And here's what he has to say about himself in the seventh chapter. Who is this Amos? Verse 14, Amos chapter 7, verse 14. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go and prophesy unto my people Israel. Who is this guy? He's a herdsman. He's a cattleman. He's a timber man. He's a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord came with a definite call upon his life. There was a day in Baptist circles in this country, Tennessee in particular, when there was a God-called group of countrymen that received a genuine call from God And not only in Baptist circles, in many other circles and churches as well, they farmed by the week. They rode their circuits and preached on the weekend. And the power of God was upon this nation. I would to God I had more education than I do have. You know what I'm saying? You can never get enough. I tell young people graduating from high school, go to college if you can. Go to trade school if that's not your thing. Go in the military. In fact, my personal belief is that every young person graduating from high school ought to get their diploma and go to the recruiting bus and get on the bus to boot camp and serve in the military in the United States. I think it would be good for every young person graduating from high school to go immediately into military service. But there was a time when we relied upon the power of God in the simple lives of the men of God to lead America. And brother, we had revival in America. Churches were formed. Pioneered communities heard the gospel. And the power of God was evident. And we got a guy in the Bible in the Old Testament who was like that. His name is Amos. He was from the little village of Tekoa. If you go to modern-day Jerusalem, go five miles over to Bethlehem and then go south six miles, you'll be at the location where this young man grew up. And God called him to go up to the ten northern tribes. You see, there was a split in the land of Israel. The nation had been split. The golden time in the nation of Israel was when David was king in Israel. And then Solomon became king in Israel after David. And after Solomon, Israel got in a squabble among themselves and the nation got split. They were split north and south, much like America is split today. And God called a southern preacher to go up north and to give them a warning about what was about to happen to the ten northern tribes, you see there was a threat coming. It was from the Assyrian Empire. They were going to overrun the ten northern tribes. They would take them out into captivity, intermarry with them, and in the days of Jesus you would have a different race of Jewish people, half Jewish, half of the nation of Assyria, and they would be called the Samaritans of the New Testament. Jesus went to Jacob's well in John chapter 4 to meet a woman coming from the city of Sychar. Remember the story? She'd had five husbands, was living with a man she wasn't even married to, and Jesus assured her that he was the Messiah, and she got wonderfully and gloriously saved and went back in the city and told the man, come see a man who's told me all that ever I did is not this the Christ. But that's a few hundred years from Amos. In the time that Amos was making his promises and God was calling him to send him throughout the land, it was a land, the nation of Israel, the ten northern tribes, was filled with swearing and 
and stealing and injustice and oppression and robbery and adultery and murder and homosexuality. Does that sound familiar in America today? Where are we at? Swearing and stealing and injustice and oppression and robbery and adultery and murder and homosexuality? Does that sound like something that's taken place in America today? It was what led to the downfall of the ten northern tribes of Israel. God gives his indictment. He calls out their sin and he calls them to repentance and they would not repent. What have we been through? This is the second Sunday, if my memory serves me correctly, this is the second time that the choir has been back singing for us in about a year's time. Why? Not that we didn't love the Lord, but we had a pestilence, we had a pandemic that came upon this nation, dear friends, and we're just now coming back, and we're coming back with a boom. America is coming back. Corinth is coming back. But my question is, have we learned any lessons? Have we repented? Remember 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people which are called my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God promises, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. How many times did you see this phrase in here? Yet you have not turned unto me, saith the Lord. What was God calling for? He was calling for Repentance. Repentance. Repent of your sins and turn back to God. That's exactly what America needs to do. I'm amazed at what's going on in our country. So many things, you know, history repeats itself. And if you will not learn from the history of the past, you're doomed to repeat it again. I heard a phrase this week, I never heard it before in my life, but it's very truthful. If you pay folks to be poor, you're going to end up with a lot of poor folks. And this is what's happening in America today. I mean, what's going on in this nation of ours? Is it doing the people of America a favor or are we turning them from God? Government is not my God. My allegiance is the Lord God. Look at the situation of that day. Again, verse 1. Amos chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan. Verse 2 later, he calls them cows. Verse 3. And you shall go out of the breaches every cow and that which is before her. Feminine. A kind is cattle. And J. Vernon McGee is, in my opinion, a real good Bible authority. I'll be honest with you. He's as good as anybody I've ever studied under. Some of you use J. Vernon McGee in lieu of some of the Sunday school literature that Southern Baptists print. And I say, amen. Amen. Could I trust him? He was primarily a Presbyterian preacher, but he loved Jesus. <laughs> He loved, he loved the Word of God. He preached the Word of God on the radio. When I was a young preacher, I would travel to school. I would travel to revival meetings across this country, and I would listen to J. Vernon McGee, 30 minutes of through the Bible on the radio. And he brought out something I'd never read before regarding Amos chapter 4, that the real problem that led to the downfall of the ten northern tribes was the feminist movement among the leadership of that part of the nation of Israel. He says on verse 1, ye kind, it's a feminist term. In verse 11, 
He's inspired to write. The Lord says, I've overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a fire bland plucked out of the burning, yet you have not turned unto me, saith the Lord. I think the guy's got a valid point on it. Reading the history and studying the history of the demise of the Roman Empire, the same thing popped up in Rome and they're on the trash heap of history today. No nation has ever gone as far down this path of immorality and injustice as America has and has survived That, dear friends, is a stark warning to your old preacher. What J. Vernon McGee preached about and wrote about in his commentaries was published in 1980-something, like 86. He'd been dead for a long time. Was he a prophet of God? No, he just understood the word of God. And he saw where things were beginning to get off track in America way back there. Look at verse 4. Come to Bethel, they said. Come to, they had a religion. I mean, they had a religion, but it was a false religion. It was a false worship of the true and living God. We got more religion in America than we know what to do with. You're not saved by religion. You say you're narrow-minded. Well, I'm not as narrow-minded as some of my friends. I got some kin folks over in Arkansas that are so narrow-minded on a few things in the Bible that a gnat can sit on the bridge of the nose and kick out both eyeballs at the same time. That is narrow-minded. I'm not that narrow-minded. But I'm going to tell you, I'm narrow-minded on the subject of salvation. I'm narrow-minded when it comes to the subject of who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And I'm going to tell you, friends, it is Jesus, 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 and still Jesus. There is no other way. He is the way. I'm sorry. He's the, it's not a Baptist way. It's not a Presbyterian way. It's not a Methodist way. It's not a Catholic way. It's not an evangelical way. It is a Jesus way. He is the one and the only way. I am the way, he said. I am the truth and I am the life and no man can come to the Father except by me. But they said, come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal, multiply transgress and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. Boy, that wouldn't help us build a 500-seat sanctuary, tithe it every three years, would it? They wouldn't quite get it. I got a figure, I got a feeling they didn't keep too good a record back. They didn't add it up. No wonder in the book of Malachi, God said, you have robbed me. Wherein have you robbed me? You robbed me in tithes and in offering. They didn't keep up with it. They didn't add it up. Bringing forward after three years, I guarantee you that. Look in verse 6. Amos chapter 4, verse 6. I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and a want of bread in all your places you have yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Look at chapter 8 and verse 11 and 12. There was a famine in the land, all right. You check grocery prices lately? Huh? If you think the price of groceries... In the supermarket is high now. You just wait till all this stuff hits. You ain't seen nothing yet, and I'm not the son of a prophet. But I sure do keep up with the trends of agriculture. All right, look at verse 14 of Amos chapter, chapter. Well, go to verse 11, I'm sorry, Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come and saith the Lord that I will send a famine in the land. 
not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. There's a lot of religion. There's very little Bible. In fact, in America, we got so many translations of the Bible that it appears to me there's some folks that think that the Bible says whatever it is they want it to say. That ain't the way it is, folks. I'm sorry. I am sorry. One of the greatest truths I ever learned when we, when we had the uh, banquet the other day for our graduating seniors, a scholarship banquet. I concluded the scholarship banquet. I was the last one to speak and to pray, you know. And I said one of the greatest truths I ever learned in all my life was learned in a little Sunday school class in a little country church. You know what it was? Jesus loves me, this I know, for my Bible tells me so. If you hadn't learned that yet, you ain't very smart, friend. Jesus loves me, this I know, for my Bible tells me so. There's coming a day when there's going to be a hunger and a thirst, a famine, for the true word of God, and that day's here. That day's here. So what are you supposed to do? Well, I'm going to tell you what we're supposed to do. Look at verse 12, Amos chapter 4, verse 12. The Bible has the answer. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God. You say, I never have met God. You haven't looked up at the sunshine. You haven't seen the twinkling of a star. Huh? Don't tell me that God doesn't exist. Even an old guy one time years ago up in the mountains of East Tennessee, he claimed to be an atheist. He said, I don't believe in God, thank God. I said, you ain't no atheist. You're thanking God that you don't believe in God. My Bible says only fools will say in his heart, there is no God. That man was no fool. He was educated beyond his intelligence. That was his problem. He had got all figured out. He said to me, have you ever spelled dog? I said, D-O-G, where are you getting that? He said, spell it backwards, G-O-D, God. I guess his dog was his God. I don't know. What did he do? Prepare to meet thy God. Repentance and faith, repentance and faith, repentance. God said, I've warned you, I've warned you, I've warned you, I've warned you, and yet you've not returned to me. You have not repented. You have not returned. That's what repentance means, a return. Leaving your sin behind. Turning to Jesus. I want to close Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It's kind of like a Baptist theme verse or whatever. Really, it's a Bible theme verse, okay? It's a salvation Clarification verse. It is the best commentary in all the world on the subject of salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is not of works. Lest any man should boast. Grace is unmerited favor of God towards undeserving sinners. Faith is your responsibility in reaching up and claiming the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the cleansing of God for your very own. The Christian faith is different from the world's religion in that we have a Messiah, Savior, that lived and died, was buried, and rose again the third day from the dead. And one of these mornings, he's coming again in the clouds of glory. And you better be ready, prepared to meet your God. Let's pray. 
eternal God and heavenly Father, we realize that nations get off track, that individuals get off track. But, Lord, we also realize that we have a personal responsibility that whether anybody else in this nation serves God, that we do. Or whether any other nation on the face of the earth serves God, that we will. And so I pray, God, today, if there's any person here who has never repented of their sin, never put their personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, I pray that this today, whether inside this sanctuary, whether online in their living room, or wherever this message goes out, I pray, God, if this message touches the heart and life of any person that's lost, Headed for devil's hell, may they repent of their sins, open up their hearts, and invite Jesus Christ to become their Savior and their Lord. May they claim the promise of heaven, of eternal life, of heaven for their very own. Lord, move upon us, we pray, through the power of the Holy Spirit. May somebody get saved, may safe folks get revived and empowered and drawn closer to the resurrected living Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. And amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing hymn number 113, God Moves Upon Your Heart. There's a reason, there's a need to respond today, will you? Will you? Now I'm coming home. Will you do that today? Will you do that today? The paths of sin too long I have trod. We sing, Lord, I'm coming home. Will you do that by repentance and faith? We're having an open invitation inside the sanctuary of Corinth Baptist Church, Garden, Tennessee. But God's love is not limited to the sanctuary of Corinth Church. Whether you're in America, North America, South America, Central America, the Middle East, Africa, Australia, wherever God finds you today, this could be your day of salvation. Will you open your heart today and receive him as Savior and as Lord? You need to prepare to meet God. You're leaving this old world one day. You need to be prepared. You've wasted many precious years. We sing now, I'm coming home. Will you do that today? Wherever you are today, will you give your heart to Jesus? Make this your day of salvation. I now repent in bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming home. Will you do that? If you will, Jesus will receive you. He will save you. He will forgive you. You can be saved and know that you're saved. You can claim the promise of heaven when this life is over. It is yours, free for the asking. Will you come today? Will you come publicly and openly in this service to this altar this morning to give your heart to Jesus, will you? Will you? What you waiting on? preacher spends a lot of time dealing with families in the midst of their grief. You know what amazes me, what surprises me, is the calls that I get. It is generally not from individuals I'm expecting to pass away. Many of them are surprises. The next time we roll somebody down the aisle in a casket in this church, is it going to be you? You say, oh, no, not me. You can't guarantee that. Friend, if you're not prepared to meet God, don't rush out of this building. <laughs> Between now and 2 o'clock, I got two hours. We can pray together and reason together out of the Word of God, and I'd love to do it with you if you don't know Jesus. And you're dismissed. Say, folks can leave. If you ain't saved, why don't you stay? Amen.